cool. We're so we're starting out by uh, <coughs> by, see, by seeing the dragon. So we're inviting everybody out first to tell me if they see the dragon. I guarantee you. To the, uh, I'm not gonna. I'm just. I'm gonna see if you guys if you see the dragon. It's just an inspirational question. Oh, I see two. I guarantee you will. Well, either you'll be. That's that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Or you'll probably take. The, everything will change after that. Maybe depends who you are. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking for a figure ground or a scale kind of thing. You kind of see a tail over here. Yeah. Well, it doesn't really have a head. I mean, it, there's a head there, but it doesn't seem like it attaches to much. So I'm just going to take notes while you guys are. Because that's, you know, obviously a visual focal point. We're looking for eyes. Oh, Brad's here. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, the All instruction right. is yeah, see the dragon. Well. This, this, this. I see the dragon. Do you Where see the it? dragon? I see. Well, the question is how many dragons are there? But there's the head of the dragon. It goes around like this, around like that, around like that. I'll give you guys a couple minutes because um, it'll, it'll kind of blow your mind, but I just. Nobody and then there's this one with an eye here and the nose like that. No. And okay. Nobody has any idea what they're talking about. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, this this is all right with yeah. the singular, but I'm just basically, you're all completely wrong. Well, yeah, but I'm just all completely right. I'm just too. saying, no. But <laughs> it's a session <laughs> brand. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, you're you wrong. Know, right? you know, this is going to be the stupidest thing a Kofaz ever, or one of the coolest. But basically, Nobody's seen the dragon. Oh. Uh. All right, who wants to see the dragon? I want to see the dragon. All right, stand, stand back. Stand back. I'll, I'll We'll, we'll keep Brad away in the sound. I want to not see the dragon for another minute. Okay. Then you can all, I'll, I'll let you. You can, you can stand behind him as he sees it, but then I'll, I'll let you see it as well. And then we'll then we'll actually start to talk. I think. Nobody. Nobody's seen the dragon. Well, divine dragon. It's it's very simple. But it, it'll it'll be it'll be like the. It'll pop. Actually, it will. The question is, what words will you use to make it pop? You, you want to see the dragon? Okay, all right. All right, everybody has to get behind behind Brad. This is his conference. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. First, I want you to look at Michael. You see Michael? Yeah. Now, see the dragon. You ready? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Now you've seen the dragon. I like that. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Do what that you show you you look at Michael. Tell me that wasn't cool. I know I didn't see. Right. <laughs> right. Watch. You were the dragon. They look at Brad. Okay. But does it work for me too or is it only with Michael? It's not what you're not shooting up, I guess. <laughs> I think I see the camera back there. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Anyway, I did, it was yeah. the whole point was there's a layer that nobody could see, and you know that that'll begin to talk yeah. at singularity. But basically, it, it's it's also about everyone's thinking. You're all like, where is it? Where is it? And you're like, you know, you need the right tool to unlock what it is. Yeah. We're not we're looking at what's there, not what the uh, at what it's key to. So why is this a key to that triangle? It's a glyph. Well, so now, so now I'm going to actually get into the talk at Singularity, but the whole... The uh, direction, the direction, the By the way, yeah, you, I did. you guys, if anyone asks... Sure, no, no, no. 
If you didn't come to talk, I won't show anybody the dragon. I'll completely deny it. I said that you guys were all on. Uh, so, so I. LDS. This is going to be a really, a really weird talk because uh, singularity is a really weird thing. But basically, so, Brody, can you introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Uh, 4D, because we're recording this. Oh. And this was all recorded. All the cool parts aren't on tape, which is fine. Yeah. Um, so if you made it. By the way, so was this a cool? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the talk is on, uh, on singularity and the event horizon. The official official title is "Beyond the Event Horizon." There's no turning back, so you may as well join in on the fun. So it's about it's about singularity and how it affects what's going on in computing, which sounds like a really strange, distant thing. And I'm going to talk about why it's not a strange, distant thing. Uh, and the, the idea about the dragon was to sort of just open everyone's minds. And it's a little bit like, it's a little bit like Timothy Leary, in the, in, you know, if he gave you a, a drop of LSD or something else and you saw a whole new world. And, you know, one of the, John Gage talked about this, these ideas of metaphor. So one of the metaphors of singularity, I think is very important. I think I came up with this. This software is magic. And I think that's a trait of, of what coming singularity means. The other trait is I think singularity is a wave. As opposed to a point in time. As opposed to, as opposed to a point in time. I'll sort of talk a little bit about these things and throw the ball out there. Um, obviously, if you're here, you saw the dragon. What does that mean in, in different pieces of computing? Because I think for everyone that was completely unexpected, right? Nobody had any idea that was coming. And then well, the last I, thing... I, I know I must be missing something, but it's like you held up your iPad and showed me a video which seemed to be in some way keyed off of pointing it at, at someone first, but it was the same movie twice, so why did I look at... It had, it had nothing to do with yeah. right. I, I was basically it was. It's like the idea of the looking glass and how, like what triggers the looking glass. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's also this idea that software is magic, which I think relates to the idea that singularity is a wave. And I'll explain what I mean by there. I think this is really important for anyone in computing, which is 2011. It's not equal to 2012. Not equal to 2013. So these are like the, the four points, I'll throw them out and then it'd be interesting to, to talk about them. So the idea behind that software is magic. So the idea of software being magic is to regular people and even engineers, we're beginning to disconnect between how it works. We, most engineers probably don't really understand the Intel chip or the code underneath it. As it starts to get layered away and more complex and deeper and faster, it becomes distant from us. And I think that's a sign of singularity, that we just don't understand how why it's working. It's so complex, so fast, to us, it's we becoming magic. We may never ask the question. We may not even ever ask the question. But it's, it's approaching the point where we left the era of magic prior to the Renaissance, and we had this age of science. We're almost like re-entering it with this idea of singularity, where people use iPads, they use computing, but there's a couple priests it's Sun and Microsoft or whatever, you know, maybe it used to be at Microsoft, sorry about that on the tape, um, and other companies that basically do understand what's going on, you know, Google, and then the rest of the world are kind of like, you know, you've got your Merlins and you have the rest of the world that see this software, see this technology, it's a bit like magic. But that's, it's a good thing for engineers to be disconnected, right? Otherwise, well, we, we used to understand their, their mental resources to do other things. But the, one of the one of the things on singularity, which I think it's coming and, and how it's relevant, is that in the last talk uh, by John Gage, he was talking about German engineers like learning how to play in a table. That that's really good because that's something physically you can understand it. Um, what's inside an Intel chip and how to do you know nanoparticle development in like really deep code has nothing to do with that planing, and it becomes so disconnected. It, it does, you know in your mind it is just like magic. But we uh, we grew up. The, the people who are up with. The rest of us grew up uh, in an era where we started with bits. We started with hard bits that were pieces of metal magnet. Uh, and we are the last generation that didn't have a choice but to know the guts. Right. Um, and the current generation, 
my niece and nephew uh, who are you know, 10 and 13 who use these tools, these things are just part of the environment. Just like when we were growing up, bicycles were part of the environment. So didn't we say yesterday that the, uh, one indicator of good technology is for the interface to be transparent? Um, Invisible, magical, ubiquitous, ubiquitous. So, next piece is the idea of singularity as a wave. So, I think a lot of people talk about this 30, 40 years will approach singularity. My take on it is it's sort of like a storm coming, and that the first waves are already here, and you're starting to feel the effects, and then it's going to come. And, you know, my take on it is unlike just this infinite peak. Uh, people are going to be aware of it because it's a wave, and then we're going to temper it because we're going to. It's not that we're not understanding some of the adverse effects, so it won't be an infinite peak. It'll be something that we round out and it'll subside again, and maybe something else will happen. But the idea is that singularity is actually coming ashore now. We're seeing that in, in all sorts of ways, but just the way computing is permeating our environment, uh, the intelligence in your phone, the intelligence in, in, in AI. All these things people dreamed about for so long are actually starting to come together so fast. And it's doubling, you know, the, the talk earlier we heard from AMD, uh, they're, they're not doubling GPUs at every 18 months, it's faster than that. So we're in that zone of, I think the early waves are coming, and what does that mean? Because for a long time, it was like a distant storm, and people were saying, okay, the eye of the storm is maybe 30, 40 years away, but I'm saying the, the first waves are already here, and how do you work in that environment? I'm going to skip to number four, which is because you're in that storm, you can't think of years anymore as linear steps. You know, so if you think about, oh, this is going to take me 10 years to develop, well, those are 10, 2011 years. You almost have to start thinking, what is a 2012 year going to be like? And I can't even understand that somewhat nonlinear because I'm in that singularity wave. So 2014 may be what I thought was going to happen in 2018. So we really are losing our ability to predict because the linear prediction is just completely... Um, uh, so we, we've introduced relativity into local time. Yes. And, and, and in fact, it's basically the idea, well, part of this conference is what's the future? Oh, in 2020 we'll have this. Well, those are that's 2020 and 2011 year thinking. But 2012 year thinking is not 2011 year thinking. Um, and I think that everyone's got to wrap their frame of reference when you're trying to predict, or you're trying to plan, or you're trying to do computing, that you have to, you can still predict, but if you model it in a very nonlinear way, which is quite difficult, we have to, you have, to have these abilities, and that, that's sort of one of the points about thinking like this, that linear prediction will actually be the downfall of a lot of companies. Once they start thinking we're in that singularity wave, and years are evolving already nonlinearly in all sorts of ways, you could be better prepared for what's happening. Not, and and that, uh, that's not a single time step either. Some things are getting faster and some things are getting slower. A for instance, uh, legislation. A absolutely. I think what, that's a great... The relativity argument is very interesting because it's sort of like time dilation steps mm -hmm. uh, in technology, but there's also pockets like gravitational fields where time is slower, time is faster. In energy, we're not getting that jump that we were getting in computing. So computing is like in some vortex that's occurring at a totally different rate than energy. You know, and, and we got to think, what's the lever that's pushing certain things forward very quickly in that kind of you know, relativity theorem idea? But why are things like energy or social engineering you know, actually almost regressing backwards? And it's because it's not a linear surface. It's a nonlinear, almost relativistic surface of you know, there's gravitational pockets. and. You know, we normally don't think about technology prediction in that way. We just think, oh, in 2010 and 2015. Now it's like, what is my dilation in what field, and what wave am I in? Like with energy, we're probably back in 1940 of computing. Um, but with computing, we're probably, we think it's 2011. We may be in 2013 from a 2009 prediction. So it's this idea of traveling through time in terms of your prediction. And it sounds a little confusing. And, you know, why does it apply to everyday life, particularly if you run computing or you manage large engineering groups or you're an analyst, is that your whole method of thinking about what's happening has got to totally change. Because because my, my take is that we're in that wave. I don't know when we first felt that wave, but we're there. And once you recognize we're there, to me, which is like seeing that dragon, 
now you have this whole new context of thinking about predicting uh, technology in the future. So that that's kind of my uh, my crazy spiel, and I wanted to throw the beach ball out in the air. And, so um, on the time step, I think that's a, a really special, uh, a good special um, uh, concept, and there are two pieces to it. Uh, one is we can we can start by applying a modifier to our existing thinking post process, but the question becomes how do we move from it being an add on to our think thought process to being an integral part of how we think? Well, uh, how we do this in math is uh, sometimes we have an intractable. Uh, problem and we embed it in a higher dimensional space. So, uh, and then it becomes self-evident in, in that space. So, s sometimes reframing. So, if you're an analyst, if you told a technology analyst you need to embed your thinking in a higher dimensional space, <laughs> they'll say, Joel, what were you doing in 1968? Yes. But I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. I actually think we're in that zone that people were in with the 60s with pharmaceuticals with computing in terms of the disruptive, almost psychedelic impact it's having. And that was part of the point of the dragon. If this was in the 60s, there's only one way you'd see that dragon. So computing is that lens to see those disruptive, totally nonlinear, completely unbelievable sorts of things. And I haven't solved, like, how do you deal with it? I think the, the interesting thing is just to be aware that you're in it. And once yeah. you're aware you're in it, it's like, okay, now what do we do? Most people are not, you know, most people are talking about this thing far away. I think that's a big difference. Well, he's going to be completely lost. <laughs> okay, that's what I do all the time. Anyway. <laughs> should, you, should you see the dragon quickly for a minute? Or? Sure. All right. All right. You have to, because you're late, we have to uh, we have to do something for 30 seconds and then you'll see the dragon. I can hand it the dragon. Mm -hmm. This will be very quick. We have, we, we'll get you up to speed very quickly. Do you see the dragon? Yes. You're wrong. Okay. No, you're not. <laughs> I'll, I'll, just, I'll just cut through all the BS part and like, okay, you have to stand up though. For I didn't see you didn't see it. Okay, ready? <laughs> well, first, you got to look at Brad. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, let me, let me. He's going to do like the dragon. Your dragon. Pose. See him? Yes. Okay. You can stand back. You see the dragon? Mm, now I do. It's a lot more interesting than that one. <laughs> <laughs> he looks more lively. <laughs> anyway, now you've seen the dragon. <laughs> Thank you. I've got to say, looking at that picture again reminds me of uh, Dynad Age. Yeah. So, very quickly, we were just we threw out a couple of concepts on singularity. Software's magic. Singularity is a wave. You're in the beginning of that wave. You saw the dragon, which is unexpected things are happening because we're in that wave, and that years are not equal to each other. So, if you think about predicting technology future on 2011 years, you'll be completely wrong because the 2012 year is somewhat nonlinear related to what 2011 was. But if you're predicting in 1975 what 1983 could have been, you're probably a little more linear. So by being in the singularity wave, you've entered the nonlinear zone. Now you could argue, because of Moore's law, we were in that a long time ago, but I'd argue that it was kind of a flat thing. But now that it's, it's starting to arc, Things are changing, so now you're in the nonlinear part, the accelerating, changing, bizarre, somewhat chaotic part of, of this incoming singularity wave. Like yeah. Or the singularity has a wave structure. Um, it's not a single wave; it's a series of waves. It's a series of waves. Yeah, that's a good one. And uh, and in some portions of those waves, you're, you, there's linear predictability, and in other portions, there's not. Well, the, that's pretty awesome. Seeing the, the future isn't what it used to be, is what comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> hey, these, are, these are all great, man. <laughs> well, the singularity is a series of waves. Well, the singularity is a series of waves, and during some uh, portions of the wave, uh, 
you can predict in a linear fashion, and other portions you cannot. I predict linear. The, other thing, the thing about a wave is that on, on and, and yours is that, is that did you just make that up? It used to be. It's uh, I'm sure I heard it some okay. apocryphal, I but, it, but it's somewhere. It's, but it's it seems particularly apt. Yes. That the I think so the, the disruptive thing to industry is that you've got all these accountants and all these CEOs and all these people and they're having analyst meetings and here's my financials and blah 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 and then all this chaotic stuff bubbling underneath and if you're a, uh, if you're a Wall Street guy you're an accountant you're a CFO this is completely freaking out it's like the hippies storming the gates of a university campus but it's basically nothing they can do about it and businesses sort of have to wrap their minds about this idea because it's sort of happening to them whether they like it or not. If they don't get on it, they'll basically not exist anymore. So what we have to ask is, what affects the wave? What affects the wave function? You don't need to write the date. We've, we've got it on okay. the back of it. What affects the wave function? And how does the wave function affect us? That's cool. I didn't realize Brad was the co-presenter. There's no presentation. This is a round. <laughs> this is a briefing. Okay. Right, I just, I just threw some, the beach ball and it's supposed to bat around a little bit. Everybody's supposed to say something. What affects the wave function? And, we'll and then how does the wave function uh, impact us? How does wave function impact us? And, and because there's a circular interaction there. For instance, lack of resources will change that wave function somewhat in, in certain areas. Politics will, will change that wave function. Uh, is it a strange loop? Uh, yeah. And, and is it... Is it predictable or chaotic? So you know, you know, is it a Hofstetter? Yeah. <laughs> so is this a Ho we, uh, is this a Hofstetter strange loop within a singularity wave, which is probably the only kind of thing you could ever say to Cofed's conference <laughs> <laughs> or Ted? Um, yeah. But basically, you know, does everybody know what a strange loop is? No. No. <laughs> you, you probably know better than I do. A strange, let's see, uh, Joel's the one who will be able to pull it out correctly. I'll give you a strange loop example. Yeah. I, can't, I can't explain it very well, but the, the classic example of strange loop is a video feedback loop. Where if you've got two cameras looking at each other and you project that, you start to see the weird hypnotic spiral. And you're like, how is that happening? And it's like the noise patterns Interact. uh, interacting in ways that you have no idea and you get this completely chaotic effect. And basically, if you think about being in a chaotic place, like we are now, that is very disturbing. Unless you're a technologist, that's great, because you just don't know what's going to happen. If you're in an innovation funnel just popping around you. Uh, but if you're trying to predict stuff, if you're an analyst, if you're trying to make the world very smooth and everything's cool, uh, things like strange loop concepts, which Hofstadter brought out, basically undermine you terribly. So how do you operate in a nonlinear, chaotic world, which is basically true? It is what's happening. There's nothing you do about it. You just need to realize it. But then how do you do business in that framework? How do you understand how to operate in that framework? What, what happened? John, John has uh, uh, courtesy of Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, there you illustration go. of the strange loop. So another, another one is when you have a strange loop, emergent properties uh, happen um, that are... Uh, Unexpected. Un, un, uh, well, I, what I was going to say is emergent properties appear that are hidden without the loop. That is, there's some, some fundamental underlying relationships that... Um, uh, or, so in, in the words of... I think, that's called, I think that's really about seeing the dragon, actually. Yeah. When, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> I'm serious. Who would have thought Yogi Berra would come up? <laughs> well, actually, that's that's not crazy at all because yeah. the idea of probably you know quantum theory is why don't you need to be thinking about taking both things at the same? Yeah. Maybe Yogi Berra was actually quite a genius. Yes, you don't make a decision about left or right. right. You're, you're, you're roll with both. Alive and dead. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's alive, dead, and both. <laughs> 
you know, but, but how do you translate this kind of like sort of techno hippie talk into something actually doable in a company? You know, so if you're if you're the CEO of a, of a giant software company, and then your 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 uh, technology advisor starts talking like this, you probably will just throw them out and get a technology advisor that goes, "Here, everything is fine." Yeah, here's uh, a spreadsheet. <laughs> right, right. And there's no right. spreadsheet I think that can contain it. Maybe that's a key thing, because uh, how do you ex how do you deal with this? How, what kind of formats do you need to contain modeling for a company or what's happening to basically express that? Well, the, the, the challenge is that you're, you're challenging our, our fundamental anchor, which is time. We believe that time is a clock. And so, uh, and certainly in business, one of our fundamental presuppositions is there is a clock and it goes by quarters and by seconds and by hours. And, uh, and when you challenge that, then it becomes very hard to talk about things. Because if the we units are changing. Why we have a problem thinking about um, the speed of light and the impact of relativity. I, I completely agree. Time is definitely being challenged, but is that the only thing being challenged? No, it's also, it's the whole, we're always fighting the last war concept. So as a company, um, that's what you do. You, you, you know, you're, you're trying to prepare, be robust for the last black swan that just, yeah. that you just worked off the road for. And you know that it would, which is not going to be the next black swan by definition. So yeah. Well, which is why you carry a bomb on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> Delete that part. <laughs> <laughs> that was Brad. Is it really small? Yeah. But no, I think I think the idea of time being challenged is one of these things. But I think we're being, and it's going to sound strange, we're being mentally challenged. We, we don't understand what that means. Not not just the time part, but these computational non-linearities. What it means for us. I I this strange loop thing that that we've got here. I think that we're experiencing that right now in this room. Uh, no, uh, I'm thinking more globally in terms of uh, there are a number of things set in motion uh, over the last several hundred years based on the politics of uh, the. Uh, uh, political structures of, of countries, the individual, the intersection of the political will and structure of com uh, countries and the individual actions of, of specific players. And they are interacting in a way that is uh, predictable in retrospect. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a great example of that. Uh, we use UAVs, the US government uses yeah. UAVs to do business in Afghanistan and Iraq. Obama is not capturing people at the rate that Bush did. He's just blowing people up remotely with UAVs at a rate probably four to five times that. So it kind of, if you know, you're, if you're a Democrat or liberal, you kind of blows your mind. But there was an article, I think it was Time or Newsweek just a month back, saying that the kill rate with Obama with UAVs is like, you know, much, much higher than Bush. Bush is trying to catch them. And what they're just doing is they're just flying. They see who it is. They're actually using social network technology with with young kids out of college to try to predict if we know that guy's family's here and his friend is there, he might be in that building, probabilistically just blow it up. So we're, the, what, one of these singularity wave things is we're doing war business using things like semi-autonomous UAVs with no consequence back to us from a human capital perspective. We're waging war right now in some area with no no human consequence. So imagine you just keep going that way with the no, U.S. Or well, on one-sided. One side. <laughs> We're attritioning their uh, resources. So there's a con like a singularity wave of consequences. Uh, you can wage warfare with no political consequence. Uh, usually political consequences like you lose a lot of soldiers in Vietnam, they're bringing bodies home. What if we could wage war and not a single American soldier has even a remote chance of being killed? Now, we may be blowing the heck out of people, but we're already in that pocket. See, we don't even realize that, that we're actually doing business like that right now, and it's very quiet. Most Americans and most people in the world don't realize it unless you're in Afghanistan or Iraq. But that's a singularity wave pocket of, here, that's already jumped the gun. Now, why do you want to say that this is part of the singularity wave? So the UAV um, in 2000, was interesting. 99 was like a science project. In 2011, 
we do business with tens of thousands of these. They're mostly autonomous. They find the target. There's a guy in a room playing a video game in, in Washington, D.C. Don't ask me how I know some of these things, but I can, I can confirm that. And they're just watching a target put a click on it, press a button, boom. What, what kind of harm's way were we in? There's no pilot. You didn't even have to fly the plane. You just like Google mapped it to some degree and say, go here, look for things. We have video software that is using machine vision recognition to find those things. We have facial recognition to match them to those terrorists doing most of the work for us. So like go forward 10, 2011 years, I don't even know what that means. They'll just be doing that business and probably Obama gets a, or whoever's president, will get a, I accept, you know, like bombing. <laughs> You know, you'll get a text message, uh, you know, kill Would order, you like boom. Would like accept or should I? Accept or yes. Well, well but, but it sounds no, like no, what no, no, saying. list will go down by one. I would like to work. I would like to be <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I got a friend living here. We're doing, we're doing, we're doing business like that. We're, 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 we're seeding Skynet. What this, is? this is the beginning of Skynet. No, 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 I'll tell you the beginning. <laughs> I, I want to frighten you guys one more thing. I'll tell you the beginning of Skynet. <laughs> Don't ask me some things, but basically we brought down at Mako, and you know, I'll tie this into robotics at some point, um, the kid that hacked the Kinect. The Kinect camera, machine vision, paints the room with 3D infrared laser light. You're like, okay, what's the big deal about that? In one weekend, he wired that to a Roomba. In a couple of weeks, he had a room full of these machine vision Roombas doing tank-like intelligence maneuvers in a gymnasium. And then in a couple months, he had these UAVs made in Switzerland for about three grand, he had about several dozen in a, in a gymnasium, flying around doing coordinated AI swarm, guided by a little Skynet piece of software he wrote himself. He'd put little toy soldiers there, and they would all kind of swarm over and do things, and they were all talking to each other, and he'd just sit back and supervise. He actually had given a talk at the Pentagon before he came out to Mako, and kind of, we brought him down to see about the Connect. And then uh, all of a sudden we learned all these interesting things. So Skynet, which everyone thinks is some abstract thing, is happening in this remote pocket. He's living in Skynet. Now, you think, okay, that's going to happen in 20 years, maybe 20, 2011 years, but that may be happening in 2016. I have no idea. And, and that's the idea that in these little pockets, there are these singularity waves that are moving much faster. And when you sort of find them, it's, it's quite disturbing because it's moving at a rate you didn't expect. Most people, again, have no idea. They're just sort of carrying out, you go to McDonald's, you buy a Coke. That's happened for the last 50 years. Everything's fine. You don't think there's some guy at MIT building Skynet, which he is. You don't think Obama has UAV smart robots blowing people up, and he just hits a I accept button, which literally is what they kind of do today. So, I mean, you know, again, how do you apply that to computing and software and engineering? Everyone thinking, oh, CAD is moving in this way, and this is where software is going to go. It's very, it may be so nonlinear disruptive, we just don't know what things look like in five years. And that's kind of a scary thing to accept when you're trying to predict an industry. Unless everyone actively just holds it back and says, we'll just stop everything from being innovative, and then it'll move its way to China and they'll unleash it. So anyway, that was the monologue. So, so I, I have a, um, a, a, a semantic question. We're... we're uh it seems like the the singularity sub Kurzweil is uh, is defined uh, as a, a conversion of trends, and by talking about the singularity wave, we're we're kind of reversing that. Co-opting it, yeah. Yeah, and just saying, okay, the effect of these things which we did not define has these feeder phenomena. Feeder which bands. We, yeah, which we will now say are part of the singularity wave. I'm not saying that's invalid. I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it so I know what yeah. we're talking I, I about. I think that we can take the singularity out of the equation entirely and, and stop talking about it. We go back to the very beginning and say, uh, take the word uh, singularity out and talk about... A. It feels like a Wikipedia yeah. page, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brad wants to edit. Talk, to talk about um, uh, time, innovation, and progress. If you want to use progress in the in the less formal sense, um, progress is the antonym of Congress. 
Yeah. Um, time, innovation, and, and progress. Um, the, 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 what we were referring to as singularity is where those things happen um, out of sync with the rest of uh, people's daily lives. And I'm positing that's already here. Right, it, but, but okay. I'm, just, I'm just changing the, phrase, the phrasing oh, okay. of it from singularity to th this time innovation progress uh, decoupling. Right. Yeah, well, you're sort of, we're sort of redefining it as not the, the scientific version of rapture, which is boom, you know, and, and it always times with like when the guys predicting it are about to die. Yeah. Like singularity would occur a year before I'm supposed to die, so that will then I could live forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of it. But basically, yeah, so this is decoupling and almost like reclaiming it. Yeah. So back to your question about companies. So should companies have not just technology scoping, but singularities? I mean, should we be out there looking for this kid, Skynet kid? Should, uh, mm -hmm. have, I'll give you this Skynet kid the, example. The Skynet kids are not the guys that. I that can't, I would, can't say right now. <laughs> <laughs> the Skynet kid is not the guy who has a resume and is going through the job fair. No. Yeah. So how? Here's what Intel's trying to do. Intel, in some way, is fumbling around, thinking we just don't, you know, we don't know what we're doing. So it's his it's, it's title is either like chief of innovation or something. But they they've hired Will I Am, the lead singer of the Black Eyed Peas, to lead innovation for Intel. To me, that was a signal of a singularity wave. So here's Intel, and, and, and they got Will I Am because he's like maybe a, a, a nonlinear thinker, and they're saying, run our, run our innovation side, go around Intel, and, and he is the only person to tell, I think, other than like a couple top executives that has this black access card. Uh, you know, like the kind of the, I can get anywhere and go see anything and talk to anybody. And they're, and they're basically saying, because he's got a creative mind, they're just cutting him loose and saying, tell us what we need to do. Which is, which is kind of amazing, but I mean, you've got Intel, which has probably reached a stagnant point in terms of innovation, going, what do we do? And they just nonlinear go, will I am? You know, so it's like, I don't know, is AMD going to go grab, like, you know, Lady Gaga? Is that <laughs> but it actually happened. You know, it's, it's not like is a... Is that a sign of giving up? Or a sign <laughs> of... No, I, think, I think that's creating a black swan. Uh, non literally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, because because the idea of a black swan is something you couldn't predict. So you right. bring you bring a wild card in. They're trying to loose. disrupt things yeah. with chaos. Yeah. Um, and you know, again, I think that's a sign of the the organization that's so static, trying to actually throw themselves into the, the singularity way. But it's like we're at the beginning of very bizarre things happening. I, like five years ago, that would anyone have said, Will I am will be like the head of innovation at Intel? In, in a, an ad for Salesforce. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, most, the most ridiculous ad in the well, world. Right. I, I don't know what that is. I don't have know you ever seen it? No. Oh, yes. But you know, if you're a technology Our company, if you're, uh, uh, you make software, you make CAD, whatever, you need to be aware of things like Intel making those kind of moves. What does that mean? Because it used to be like, okay, Gordon Moore and you know chips, and like now their innovation is being driven by a guy who is like maybe very free thinking. That could be great. It could also be have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, but yeah, which is not Will I Am's fault. Will I Am is a manifestation of the reality of what's actually going on, which you just don't know what's going to happen next on some level, so which is exciting and dangerous. So my father used to tell me tales of uh, a. Uh, legendary, uh, a mythical Polish village called Helm, oh. where, where <laughs> the, the people are notoriously, uh, are notoriously foolish, and there, there are many very wise stories though about the people of Helm. No, this is a great, yeah, it's so a perfect. It's, so three guys are sent out from Helm, and I forget what the mission is, but they're to buy something for the village or something. And one night it's very cold, so they sleep very close together, and their legs get all tangled up. And in the morning they can't get up because their legs are all tangled up, so they're crying and crying. And a, a Polish peasant comes, sees what the problem is, doesn't say a word, goes over, finds this very large rock, lifts it over his head, and is about to throw it down on their legs when suddenly they all pull their legs <laughs> out of the way. 
before the boulder hits them. And they get so happy and they thank the peasant who was, of course, willing to sell them the boulder for a very large <laughs> fee. And it sounds like... We're, we're in hell. Yes. And, and Will I Am is the boulder. Yes. yes. <laughs> I, I, that's a wonderful... I, again, like... like, like uh, Bringing up Shalom Aleichem and Chalm in uh, Chokhmah is probably one of the only ways you can do that. <laughs> but yeah, if you read his books, they're great. They try to catch the moon by a big pool of water, and then they throw a, a drape over it, and they bring it to the king, and they peel it off, and it's not there, and someone thinks they stole it, and it, it's just like a whole... But basically, I feel like we're like companies may be in that in that the the non-creative people that often manage the yeah. companies have no idea what's happening and do helm like things, which maybe is also a, a, a symptom of, of this kind of... So, so I'd like to step aside for a second and look at the delineation between the necessary and mundane and the um, uh, innovative and future. We can't have one without the other. Well, we can have the, the mundane without the, the future, but that just doesn't happen. The innovation and future will like accounting or uh, well, I'm thinking cheese. about I need I need my cheese. I, I I still want to get my I still need to to get transported from one place to another. I still need a faucet to uh, deliver water to me. Uh, you know there there are things that need to get uh, done. So where do you draw the line between uh, the thinking about? where I'm going to be or where things are going to be and where do I need to play and the mundane of people still need windows. Well, it's, it's great that you're bringing it up because I think, I think that's the tempering function on, on Curse Weil's infinite asymptote because the reality is like, you know, it, I call it like your mom or your wife, go out and take the garbage. You know, you've yeah. got all the technical guys and we're dreaming up, you know, dragons and they're like, could you just mow the lawn, take out the garbage, you know, do the homework with the kids? There, there's like tempering functions which are, are just basically normality. And people think like everything's, you know, your mom is not all of a sudden going to go into singularity like Kurzweil's predicting. She's going to be like, you know, making you chicken soup and basically telling you to, you know, to eat better. And that's yeah. probably not going to change and that's a tempering function. Maybe, maybe not. Because I stopped vacuuming a couple of years ago because of bought a Roomba. Yeah. And vacuuming is very mundane yeah, yeah. <laughs> and boring, so but, that's but, my favorite thing in the house. <laughs> now you have to clean the Roomba. I have to, to, to clean so the Roomba. That could be your favorite activity. Number one selling robot in the world. The what? The Roomba is the number one selling robot. Right, so I think, I think we will... I thought it was... Uh, no. You still need to do quarterly reviews. You still need to have uh, earnings. You still need to become the producer Why? revenue. Why, do I, why does it need to be quarterly? <laughs> It only, it only needs to be That's quarterly, or it only needs to be quarterly if I have investors who live by the quarter. And uh, one of the things that we had when uh, 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 Bo was here, Bo Birmingham, um, uh, uh, and his whole movement for uh, being great was, you know, ha thinking twice before you go into a uh, environment where you need to live by the quarter. Hmm. Because it is a choice. Yes. Because un unlike the Lone Ranger who asked no quarter nor gave any to the forces of evil. Is that one of the functions that's limiting uh, U.S. innovation where in China there may not be that issue? Yet. I mean, yet or yet? Yet. Or yet. 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 <laughs> I mean, the stock market is picking up there, so... So you think this, this sort of like constraining function may overlay them and, and on that specific edition. subject I personally hate the, the idea that companies Quarterly. think for qu on quarters and some of them uh, are almost run by Wall Street so whatever it takes to make the, the, so the, the actually, numbers if you're an analyst okay go on the other side and you're trying to take you know do well for your share for shareholders and to give them information what well, do like, you want what you end up with with uh, on Wall Street is a uh, cascading uh, cascading series of abstractions. So the quarterly report is an abstraction, and the, uh, what Wall Street is looking at for a company 
is an abstraction of that report. And what they do is they combine those abstractions and bundle them together into bigger abstractions. So, so the information to, value content is to say junk food. Uh, well, the, the point is that if, so, if there was a way to, uh, and I'm not suggesting that there is, but uh, we've embedded or or built this uh, series of abstracting thinking, and there's more leverage. The higher the, the abstraction, the, the higher the leverage, mm. and the greater the risk in the game. Well, why, why is it really so bad? I mean, come on. If you want to achieve anything, you have to measure it over some time period. Right. Yeah, but, but metrics, right? let me give you an example. Or, yes. Or, or we all just say, oh, I, I love that you brought that up because how do you apply metrics? In a nonlinear chaotic situation. How do you apply metrics without a time element? You can't. No, so you have a time element, but how do you play, apply metrics in a nonlinear environment? Okay. So, I'm a, a, big question. Do you apply metrics to your personal relationships? You think of time lunch or a time time line or a timeline? Or lunch time. Thank you. Oh, okay. I guess so we, can, we can take this. I, I think, think you do subconsciously, maybe not consciously, but subconsciously you do. Because this time was about X amount better than last time. <laughs> but you, you quantify your relationships, not it's gotta subconsciously. You have to compare not the last quarter, but the quarter from the year before, <laughs> because of the uh, <laughs> seasonal changes. <laughs> I mean, we're probably moving into a, 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 a different type of zone. Ronnie, I really want to thank you for, for tackling this. Show and, me the dragon. And uh, I, I think that there's some really special thinking that has uh, come out of this, particularly the, the idea of nonlinear time. Yeah.